We've been going through the book, the Old Testament book of Joshua. And today, on the 17th of December, 2023, we've arrived at the final chapter of this um, old, wonderful Old Testament book, Joshua chapter 24. And I've titled today's message, Lest We Forget lest we forget Joshua chapter 24 and while you turn there I had mentioned last week that these last two chapters are pretty much considered farewell chapters last week when we covered 23 we saw Joshua for the most part speak to all the leaders of Israel and Covered a bunch of things there. Won't get all into it again. But this now here in chapter 24 will be his second farewell address. And now he will be pretty much speaking to the entire nation. All the, cheap, all the people from all the tribes, including the leaders. And now there's a shift in venue as well. <clears throat> we learned in chapter 23 that Joshua was uh, and met his leaders there in Shiloh. Well, here now this week, the venue changes, and this farewell, this final farewell address takes place at Shechem. Now, there's a lot of historical value at Shechem. A lot has happened there and it definitely was more or less a holy place. It was at Shechem that God promised Abraham that his descendants would inherit the land in Genesis chapter 12. And there Jacob had built an altar in chapter 33, Genesis 33. Now, located between Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim, Shechem was also where the people of Israel had reaffirmed their commitment to the Lord in Joshua chapter 8. And it was pretty much after their defeat at Ai, or they, where they rebounded, I'm sorry, after they, their defeat at Ai. If nation and land were the key words in chapter 23 in Joshua's first address, then the Lord is the major focus in this second address. See, Joshua refers to the Lord 21 times. In fact, in verses 2 to 13 of this chapter, it is the Lord who speaks as Joshua reviews the history of the nation. Now, another key word that we're going to see here is serve or worship. And it's used 15 times in this address. The people will be reminded that it was God who gave them their land and would bless them if in their land if they loved him, served him, worshipped him, and obeyed him. Some of the things, one of the things we're going to be seeing here in this chapter. See, believers have, all of us, all of us believers have a disposition towards seeking to worship and serve the Lord half heartedly instead of completely like Joshua did. Here in this chapter, we're going to see that God doesn't tolerate that, God will not tolerate neutrality. Chapter, chapter 24 will focus, will challenge us and may be standing at a pre precipice, at a fork in the road. See, we must choose to serve the one who has chosen us or choose not to serve him. Friends, there is no middle ground. There is no halfway 
There is no one foot in, one foot out. So with that, let's pray and ask the Lord to bless us in this final chapter of the book of Joshua. Heavenly Father, you've brought us so far and you've taught us so many things throughout this entire book, Lord. And I just pray that as we now cover the last chapter, that you will once again minister to us, speak to us clearly, and move powerfully here in this room. I pray that you will use the words your words that are found here to change lives, to change hearts, to change the direction of people's lives. May they finally make, may some of these people hearing this finally make that decision that they've been holding off on for so long. And just choose choose 100% to follow you, to worship you, to serve you. Lord, I pray that you will, again, speak powerfully this morning and you will keep us safe here, Lord. And that we show, and that you will show us new truths. We thank you for this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Joshua chapter 24, verse 1. And the Word of God says, Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem and summoned Israel's elders, leaders, judges, and officers, and they presented themselves before God. Joshua said to all the people, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River, and worshipped other gods. But I took your father Abraham, and the region, from the region beyond the Euphrates River, led him throughout the land of Canaan, and multiplied his descendants. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I gave the hill country of Seir to Esau as a possession. Jacob and his sons, however, went down to Egypt. I sent Moses and Aaron and defeated Egypt by, by what I did within it and afterward brought you out. When I brought your fathers out of Egypt and you reached the Red Sea, the Egyptians pursued your fathers with chariots and horsemen as far as the sea. Your father cried out to the Lord, so he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and brought the sea over them engulfing them. Your eyes, your own eyes saw what I did to Egypt. After that, you lived in the wilderness a long time. Later, I brought you into the land of the Amorites who lived beyond the Jordan. They fought against you, but I handed them over to you. You possessed their land, and I annihilated them before you. Balak, son of Zippor, king of Moab, set out to fight against Israel. He sent for Balaam, son of Beor, to curse you, but I would not listen to Balaam. Instead, he repeatedly blessed you, and I rescued you from him. You then crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho. Jericho's citizens, as well as the Amorite, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hittites, Girgashites, Hivites, and Jebusites, fought against you, but I handed them over to you. I sent hornets against you, and they drove out the two Amorite kings before you. It was not by your so, so, sword or bow or bow. I gave you a land you did not labor for, and cities you did not build, though you live in them. You are, you are eating from vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Therefore, fear the Lord and worship him in sincerity and truth. Get rid of the gods of your fathers, your fathers worship beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt, and worship the Lord. But if it does not please you to worship the Lord, choose for yourselves today 
which will you worship? The gods of your father, the gods your fathers worship beyond the Euphrates River, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're living? As for me and my family, we will worship the Lord. Amen. As we just read, and as I mentioned earlier, the venue has shifted from Shiloh to Shechem. And there, Joshua assembles all the tribes of Israel and its leaders to give them his second and final farewell address. And as he stands and looks at the entire nation that he's seen since he was young and who have been through a lot with him, he begins by reminding all the assembled there at Shechem that, that Israel's history didn't begin with monotheism, but with a polytheistic man, Abraham, the son of Terah. That may come shock to some of you, but before Abraham became who he was, before when he was Abram, he worshipped, you know, he, he worshipped many gods. Him and his people worshipped many gods. And God picked him out for a reason and purpose. And it was nothing he did. It was by his grace alone. Upon receiving God's call, Abraham immediately answered and traveled to Canaan. Eventually, Abraham would have a son of promise, Isaac. And out of Isaac came Jacob. And from Jacob came Joseph. He reminded the people of the mighty deliverance from Egypt, the wilderness wandering, and the victory over the Moabites in the eastern side of the Jordan. He then recounted their entrance into the promised land, their victory at Jericho, and their destruction of kings, of the kings of Canaan. Now some have said that the hornet mentioned in verse 12 it may refer to the invading armies that may have attacked Canaan before the conquest. Others have suggested that it could refer to the panic experienced by the people of Canaan when they had heard what God had done for Israel. And also others do actually say that it could refer to literal hornets. <coughs> but nevertheless, Joshua's brief summary of Israel's history served one dominating purpose to showcase from Israel's history the sovereignty of God that brought them to their destiny. Notice also that in verses 3 to 12, Joshua uses the first person singular pronoun, I, for God, as he explains Israel's past deliverance and present placement. Now, for example, there, and this is just a few here. I won't mention all of them there in, from verses 3 to 12, but it says, I took, I gave, I assigned, I sent, I afflicted, I brought, I delivered, etc., etc. And finally, in verse 13, it says there, I gave you a land you did not labor for, and cities you did not build, though you live in them. You were eating vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Paul, our New Testament uh, writer Paul, echoes this same sentiment in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, by asking 
the sobering, these sobering questions. For who makes you so superior? What do you have that you did not receive, that you didn't receive? If, in fact, you did receive it, why do you boast as if you hadn't received it? Well, in that same verse, verse 13, we're provided the reason for Israel's present and future prominence. The Lord God, God Almighty, He's the one who makes us superior, as Paul asked. Any greatness Israel achieved wasn't by her effort, but through God's grace and enablement. From first to last, Israel's con- from from first to last, last Israel's of Israel's conquest, deliverances, and prosperity. They had those things because of God's good mercies, and they weren't of their own making. It wasn't anything they did. See, God and God alone accomplished it. Following this, Joshua made it clear that the people of Israel had to make a decision to fear the Lord and worship Him in sincerity and truth. Now, some of your translations might say serve, but ours here says worship. And again, it's the same word, different translation, but here we see worship. Friends, church, there can be no neutrality, no ambiguity. But if they serve the Lord, then they would have to get rid of the false gods that some of them were still secretly worshiping, some of, them, some of those idols that they were still holding on to. In the light of all God had done in Israel's history, to get them to their present destiny, their idolatry was a slap in the face of the Sovereign One. In fact, experience should have made them destroy any idol gods their father served on the other side of the Euphrates Euphrates River and in Egypt. You men... Just recently went through, oh no, I'm sorry, you went through Genesis, not Exodus. But in Exodus chapter 32, at the foot of Mount Sinai, some of you know the story, Aaron, the first high priest, he molded together, he put together all the earrings and gold stuff that the Israelites had, and he put together an Egyptian idol of a golden calf. There in Exodus chapter 32, verse 4, Aaron said this to them after he fashioned that golden calf and whatever other idols he put together. He said, Israel, these are your gods who brought you up from the land of Egypt. What ends up happening? Not long after that, punishment swiftly fail on the nation. They should have learned. They should have learned from that. Joshua wasn't suggesting that the people could choose to worship the false gods of the land, and then God would accept it. For there was no other option but to serve Jehovah, Lord God, Being a wise and spiritual man, Joshua knew that everybody, everybody, and this still applies today, Joshua knew that everybody must worship something or someone, whether they realize it or not, because humanity is 
incurably religious. If the Jews didn't worship the one true God, they would end up worshiping the false gods of the wicked nation in Canaan, nations in Canaan. And so his point was that they couldn't do both. They couldn't worship those gods, and they couldn't worship Jehovah. In verse 15, 15, Joshua then presented a ludicrous proposition to Israel. He basically tells them, this is, I'm paraphrasing it, if you think it is, it's evil or, improper, or the improper choice to serve the Lord, I have this alternative for you. Choose today, either you serve the idol gods your father served in Mesopotamia, in Egypt, or the idol gods of the Amorites in the land where you are now dwelling The choice must be an immediate one. The idolatry issue is not something that will go away. It will not go away, and there isn't really any time to think it over. You see, church, today foreshadows the sentiments of the author of Hebrews, where he says in chapter 3, verse 15, Today, if you hear God's voice, (coughs) do not harden your hearts. Joshua here is postulating that Israel's history clearly demonstrates that neither the gods of the Ur of the, Chal- of the, Ur of the Chaldeans nor the gods of Canaan are able to defend themselves against the God of Israel. None of them could. None of them could ever go toe-to-toe with the creator of the universe. They're nothing. Certainly they were incapable of defending the Israelites against God. They couldn't even defend the Israelites against other nations. To choose either group of idols over Israel's God would choose, would would be uh, choose to choose certain loss and failure. Well, Joshua now transitions from the national to the personal. Now, I'm reading this off the ESV, but verse 15 there says, But as for me and my house, we will worship the Lord. There in the beginning, the contrasting word but gives the sense that Joshua was determined on this. He was determined on this course no matter what anyone else thought. He had already made up his mind and nothing at all was going to change it. No matter how appealing the other gods may have been, because it was a, a god pretty much for every appetite for every lust of the flesh, for every lust of the eye. But he, Joshua, had already made up his mind and said, no, not me nor my household. We're going to serve the living God. Which brings up a good point. For those of you who have children at home, it's important if you've made that stance also not to allow anything, any idols, no matter if it's physical idols or, you know, mental idols or anything to to come in and into your home. You got to be able to say no. No, I, 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 I don't want, I I'm not going to have that in my house. You have to be able to make a stance. Even if your wife brings home or her husband bring homes, brings home a little Buddha, you know, or, you know, some kind of, you know, 
charm or whatever it may be, crystals. Nowadays, you're going to be like, no. I know it was definitely when, when my kids were growing up, it was something that I, you know, something I had to, I had to mention. And be like, we can't, I don't like that. I can't have that in my house because I had made a stand. I stood my ground. As for me and my house, we will worship the Lord. You see, Joshua, his relationship with God was not based on any man, but the Lord God alone. And he would worship God no matter what anyone else did. Joshua's decision meant hesitation was gone. Joshua's decision meant he lived above the evil influence of others. Joshua's decision was deep, calm, clear, fixed, well-grounded, and solemnly, solemnly made. Joshua's decision was openly made. Joshua's decision was earnestly carried out. Joshua's decision was kept throughout his entire life. Now, in modern days, and I'm not going to say anything bad about anybody who, who has this, but the statement, it's etched in wood and written in the finest paper, and it's hung in placards or signs on walls in homes. And, you know, I've seen them, you know, and, and it's fine. Again, I'm not bagging on anybody. I'm not saying anything negative. That's great. It tells me that I'm entering a, a Christian home, more than likely, and that they know their Bible. Here's the thing. These words are meant to express the heartfelt conviction of true believers who listen carefully, who are fully surrendered to worshiping the Lord. See, my friends, my brothers and sisters in Christ, as a born-again believer, your relationship with God, it isn't based on any man, but on the Lord alone. And you should serve God no matter what anyone else does. Friends, your decision to worship God means hesitation is gone. Your decision to live above the your decision means you live above the evil influence of others. Your decision is one that is deep, calm, fixed, well grounded, and also solemnly made. Your decision is openly made. I mean, it's not in secret. You made that decision openly. Your decision is earnestly carried out. And hopefully at the end of your life, this is the decision that you've kept throughout your entire life like Joshua. Church, don't allow the gods of this world. There are many. They may not be small statues that some of these Canaanites had. They may not be images of the sun or the moon or the stars. But nowadays, they're the sports stars that are hanging on teenagers' walls. You know, whoever girls have hanging in their walls, I don't know. You know? Um, boy bands. Yeah. My, wife, my, my little daughter is not into boy bands, so I know at one time Robin was, you know, but that's another story for another time. <laughs> um, other gods out there, 
money still, gambling. There is still the idol of sex, pornography, drugs. Let me remind you again that idols are those things that you've put ahead of everybody, including God. And it could be a person, it could be a thing. You've heard me share before, there was a time when my drinking became an idol. I chose that above my own family. You know, it was wasn't until I think back at that time that I realized how stupid I was and how much of an idol it was in my life. For some of you, it could be something similar, an addiction, or it could be even social media can be an idol, wanting that attention, wanting those likes, wanting those hearts, wanting uh, that attention, not having enough friends or what not, could be an idol as well. For some of you, it could be a person. Doesn't that necessarily have to be a celebrity, but it could be, yes, a spouse. It could be a child. Ask yourself, you know how it's a good gauge? Ask yourself, if this person the Lord took this person from me today and went up to be in paradise with them. What would become of me? Would I lose it? Would I fall back into my old sinful ways? You can say yes, honestly, to yourself. and Consider that that person may be an idol. Serve the Lord your God, church. My brothers and sisters, he alone is the one who has life, who can give you life, who has, who is the truth. He is the only way. The world, again, is going to try to deceive you, to fool you, to tempt you, to tell you, did God really say? Oh, if you just hold this little bunny's foot in your pocket, you know, you'll have good luck and you'll be okay. <laughs> look, look, church, everything is in God's hands. You know, I, I know at times I... I slip and I say, good luck, but there's no such thing as luck. It's God's will or it isn't. You know, God has a plan and purpose for everything. Just know that. Don't allow the idols of this world to confuse you, to mess you up, to make you think that things are, you know, another one that comes to mind is, is, um, Core scopes. You know, just because they, people say that I'm a certain, hor- I'm not going to say it, but because I, I fall under a certain horoscope or star or whatever, stars in the sky, then I have this certain personality or I'm predisposed to be this way or that way. No, I refuse to believe that. God made me who I am. And... He loves me, and he has a plan for me. And the person I was in the past isn't the person I am today. And that applies for you all as well. God has your destiny, your life, in the palm of his hand. In the palm of his hand. He knows your beginning, and he knows your end. And so who will you, will you serve Knowing that, will you serve the gods of this world? No. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. 
no matter what. Don't hesitate. All right, well, let's read what the people, how the people responded. It was a good history lesson. And again, we have to remember that he was there. Joshua was there the entire time. He, he lived through it all, so he was speaking with firsthand experience. All right, Joshua, chapter 24, verse 16. The people replied, We will certainly not abandon the Lord to worship other gods. For the Lord our God brought us and our fathers out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery, and performed these great signs before our eyes. He also protected us along the way, along the way we went and among all the peoples whose lands we traveled through. The Lord drove out before us all the peoples, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will worship the Lord because he is our God. But Joshua told the people, you will not be able to worship the Lord because he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions and sins. If you abandon the Lord and worship foreign gods, he will turn against you and harm you and completely destroy you after he has been good to you. No, the people answered Joshua, we will worship the Lord. Joshua then told the people, you are witnesses against yourselves that you yourselves have chosen to worship the Lord. We are witnesses, they said. Then they get, then get rid of your foreign gods that are among you and turn your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. So the people said to Joshua, we will worship the Lord our God and obey him. On that day, Joshua made a covenant for the people at Shechem and established a statute, not a statue, a statute, an ordinance for them. Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. He also took a large stone and set it up there under the oak of the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said to all the people, you see this stone? It will be a witness against us, for it has heard all the words that the Lord said to us. And it will be a witness against you, so that you will not, not deny your God. And Joshua sent the people away, each to his own inheritance. After these things, the Lord's servant Joshua, son of Nun, died at the age of 110. They buried him in his allotment territory of Timnath, Timnath Sarah in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. Israel worshipped the Lord throughout Joshua's entire, throughout Joshua's lifetime and during the lifetimes of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had experienced all the, is, all the works of the Lord had done for Israel. Joseph's bones, which the Israelites had brought up from Egypt, were buried at Shechem in the parcel of land Jacob had purchased from the sons of Hamor, Shechem, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of silver. It was an inheritance for Joseph's descendants. And Eleazar, son of Aaron, died, and they buried him at Gibeah, which, had given, which, he had, given, which had been given to his son Phinehas in the hill country of Ephraim. And that concludes... Joshua, the book of Joshua, my friends. Well, the, jo the Israelites <coughs> considered it foolish. Consi they considered it nonsense to even suggest a possibility of their returning to idolatry and abandoning their service to the Lord. See, for them, God was their deliverer from Egyptian bondage, sustainer, preserver, and miracle worker throughout their tech, trek in the wilderness, in the wilderness to the promised land. To paraphrase their answer to Joshua, don't even give a single thought to us not serving the Lord, but serving idols instead. 
we will stand firm and sure in obedience. Joshua then responds to them with a seemingly, another seemingly inappropriate and inaccurate statement about God's character and action. And action. God is a God of long-suffering, mercy, and second chances. Is, Israel has proven this. Israel's history has proven this. Yes, throughout their history, Israel has been the beneficiary of God's benevolence, forgiveness, and restoration. But Joshua tells them they will not be able to serve the Lord. He even tells them God will not forgive their sins and transgressions, though God has forgiven them for their past for, for, uh, has forgiven them for past generations. Hadn't he just, hadn't Joshua just told the story? However, Joshua was not talking about permissibility. He was talking about the nature of God and the nature of his people. And this is, again, where I want you to pay attention because there's some significance there with the people of Israel and now us, his children, Christian believers. See, God would not tolerate unholiness and insecurity, insincerity. He would not tolerate in, uh, unholiness and insincerity. Why? Because he is a holy and jealous God. He is a holy and jealous God. You get jealous. You ever felt jealousy in your bones because of something that happened or someone? You know what that feels like. Well, God, God our Father, He is jealous. He is a jealous God. He doesn't want you serving, worshiping other gods. Holiness is the, ens- is the essence of who God is. God is holy other. He's apart from everything else. He is righteous. And he is just. He is holy other, merciful and mighty. He is holy other, forgiving and punishing. God is set apart from everything unholy because he cannot tolerate sin. He can't stand looking at it. He hates it. He thinks it's the most grossest thing. So he can't tolerate it. Joshua aims to prevent Israel from making an emotionally charged decision here. He knows how fickle Israel has been throughout the years. He is telling their story, his story, as a crucial part of his story. And their past failure to obey and their failure to rid themselves of idols didn't bode too well for their future obedience. He knew they've made this mistake before and he was aware that they were going to make it again. He knew people. He knew that yeah on one side of their mouth they're going to be saying yeah we're going to be serving the Lord and on the other side they're like man I could sure use another drink. I can sure use another pill. I can sure use just another little bit of this, a little bit of that. He knew humanity. And yes, it didn't bode too well for the future of Israel. After the death of Joshua 
and all the elders, all the elders who survived him, another generation will arise that doesn't know the Lord or what he has done for his people. How quickly people forget the past. How pe quickly people forget, especially younger generations, forget the lessons learned from those generations that preceded them. Look around, pay attention to the world today. Especially, you know what, one that comes to mind right now is, is this, the issue with anti-Semitism. Man, it's a big topic, big issue. A lot of the major universities are dealing with that now. Oh, free speech. Is it really? Is anti-Semitism now? It's a slippery slope to something else, to racism, to all kinds of different sins. We must not, as a people, as, as Christians, we must stand up, stand up against any kind of hatred towards any kind of people. Even, yes, even towards Muslims. Muslims, you got to remember, they don't know God. They don't know the Lord. They don't know the truth. Our job, our role as Christians is to share the gospel, to share the truth. It's God who does the work. Again, this new generation that will arise after Joshua and the elders. They will resort, resort to worshiping idol gods. Joshua knew his people. Joshua knew Israel's repentance would not be sincere, and their service to God would not be genuine. And so the people of Israel continued to contend with him in verse 21. No, but we will serve the Lord. Well, Joshua eventually gives in and says, you are your own witnesses, or you are witnesses against yourself that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. Joshua challenged them to remember they heard themselves with their own ears and would be prosecutors of themselves if they did not, del not live out their commitment to worship and serve the Lord. Here's an important point. Vows, whether it's a marriage vow or whether it's a vow to a friend or whoever may be vows or even to God, they're not meant to be broken. Vows are meant to be kept. God even says in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 5, it's best not to make a vow if one isn't going to keep it. So knowing Israel's history, Joshua's warning, and the people's response, one cannot help but to wonder how Israel soon forgets the loving kindness and tender mercies of her God and falls into diverse temptations and idolatry. Israel's future after this book will be filled with disobedience and a straight-up refusal to serve the Lord. She is an unfaithful bride to a perfect husband. She is an ungrateful child to a faithful parent. She is an obstinate participant in God's holy plan. Church God knows the hearts of his people. He knows your heart. He knows your heart. He knows every single one of your hearts. And he knows we can be sincere in what we say when the threatening moment is not near. In other words, when things are good, when things are calm, when nothing bad is happening. However, when the tension has mounted, and the threat is standing 
before us believers, we become like Peter. If you remember, in the safety of the upper room, he made a great commitment to never deny the Lord, but weakened in that commitment when he stood in the courtyard of the high priest's residence. Peter denied the Lord three times because of the possibility of human punishment. He would not receive. Peter denied the Lord three times because of the possibility of human punishment he would receive if he confessed his relationship to Jesus. What would happen to you if you told people you believe in Jesus? Would you be mocked? Would you be laughed at? Would you lose friends? Would you be beaten up? Who cares? Really? Your friendship is more important, with, with your friendship to those people are really more important than your relationship with the Lord? Your fear of getting physically harmed is more important than what Jesus did for you on the cross? Are you ashamed of saying you're a Christian? Are you ashamed of saying you're a believer? You know what? Yeah, it could be easy to see a little baby Jesus laying in a manger and say, oh, how cute, how precious. But can you say the same thing to somebody and tell them that Jesus died on the cross for my sins and has forgiven me and can forgive you too? Are you being bold for Jesus, church? Believers typically don't have the greatest track records of keeping our commitments to God when the pressure is on and the temptation is before us. The Israelites would have been better, if, better served if they had said, as the Lord helps us, we will worship the Lord. So will we. So will we as believers. However, we have the Holy Spirit and must cultivate obedience from hearts of love and gratitude. You see, good intentions are not good enough. We need to be. And we have been empowered with strength that is beyond our strength. When you're being bold for Jesus, when you're standing up because for Jesus, when you are tired of being mocked and you ask by a friend, do you believe in Jesus? It's the Holy Spirit that empowers you, that gives you that strength to say yes. He is my Savior. He is my Lord. Don't be a Peter. Deny Jesus in the shadows. Have that boldness again through the power of the Holy Spirit. In verse 22, the Israelites accept Joshua's sobering warning. And once again, in verse 23, Joshua tells them, put away their foreign gods and draw near to God. They weren't perfect, but their hearts were faithful. They put off sin, struggled with sin, and put on obedience through faith. Paul used a similar language when he admonished the Roman Christians in Romans chapter 13 to put off darkness and put on light. There he says, the night was nearly over and the day is near, so let us discard the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. There isn't any room for compromise in Christian living. God chose lowly Israel and is faithful to her as he blesses all nations through her. That's why we bless and we pray for Israel. And so God expects similar dedication, determination, 
faithfulness from believers. We must put away sin. We must take it off and put on righteousness. In Matthew 12, Jesus tells the story of a house inhabited by a demon. The demon was evicted and the house was cleaned and garnished. However, the house empty, the, the house remained empty with no occupant. It remained empty and there was nobody there. The evil spirit, after staying in dry places, sought residence back in the empty house and brought seven more demons to reside in it. Jesus, well, Jesus said the last state of the house was worse than the first Putting away idol gods must be accompanied by putting on faithfulness and serving and worshiping the Lord. It cannot be a mere act. It must be true worship. The Lord has cleaned your heart. The Lord has emptied it from from sin. Allow the Holy Spirit to make his home in there to make his home in you. Don't leave it empty. Keep feeling it more and more on a regular basis. Verse 24, Israel finally understood how worshiping and serving the Lord are inextricably connected to obeying the Lord. So the people said to Joshua, we will worship the Lord our God and obey him. Believers don't give their right hands of fellowship to the preacher and then go sit down and wait for glory. No, we work while it's day because the night will come. So Joshua drew up a covenant. He wrote their words, what they had said in the book of the law took a large stone and placed it and the written document under the oak by the sanctuary of the Lord. And that would serve as state's evidence or a prosecuting attorney against Israel in the future. And when Israel denied their God and turned to serve idol gods, that would be the evidence there. Again, we talked about stones before in the history of Israel and even the church the stone that the builders rejected and how Jesus became the chosen and honored cornerstone. The stone that at the garden tomb in Jerusalem was rolled away, revealing the empty uh, borrowed tomb. Jesus had arisen. Well, after the ceremony was pronounced, uh, Joshua pronounced a benediction and the people departed back to their homes, back to their tribal lands, their inheritance. All right, so this last section ends with funerals. The book of Joshua, in fact, opens with a death. There in 1-1, if you remember, chapter 1, verse 1, the death of Moses, the Lord's servant. And it also concludes with death. Joshua, the successor of Moses, dies at 110. He began his career as Moses' assistant, but Joshua ends his ministry with a designation of the Lord's servant. Being Moses' assistant is a time condition designation and has an expiration date. Being the Lord's servant carries with it, though, a timeless declaration. For the Lord will say to those, who have been faithful in service, in worship, well done, my good and faithful servant. Joshua was buried. And in verse 31, it says, Israel was faithful in serving God throughout the years of Joshua's leadership. Furthermore, Joshua's leadership influenced Israel even after his death. Israel continued to remain faithful without the administrative leadership 
of the elders who had served with Joshua and who had witnessed my, the mighty works God had done on Israel's behalf. Now, I quickly want to share as I close just some closing thoughts of this, of this book, of what we've been covering here. Oh, well, first, let me back up just a little bit in this last section. Something I noticed. There's a trinity of debts in this chapter that approximate uh, in... There's a trinity of debts in this chapter that approximate the three persons what Christ in the three persons what Christ simultaneously embodies within himself. The roles of prophet, priest, and king. The book of Joshua is the first of the former prophets. Joshua can be seen as a prophet. He dies at 110. Like Joshua, Jesus can be seen as a prophet. Human prophets only speak the word of God. However, Jesus is the word of God. In this chapter, Eliezer, the high priest, who was the son of the first high priest, Aaron, dies. Like Eliezer, Jesus can be seen as priest. Human priests bring an offering for the people of God and intercede for the people, of God, or for the people to God. However, Jesus is the offering for the sacrifice. John the Baptist, he articulates, it, he articulates it this way in John chapter 1, verse 29, when he saw Jesus. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Additionally, our high priest, Jesus, ascended up to heaven. In this chapter, also Joseph, who died long ago in Egypt, he was buried in his promised land, in the promised land. He, he, demon, he, he had demanded that his bones be, not be left in Egypt and that he would be, they would be carried into the promised land. He was buried in Shechem. And as you all know, Joseph was second in command in Egypt and rode the second chariot behind Pharaoh. He was second in command. And so, in a sense, Joseph was a prototype of a king. A king rules and reigns over government. A government. Like Joseph, Je Jesus can be seen as a ruler within a domain or a kingdom. However, the king of kings, Jesus is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He is above and better than every single king, lord, president, prime minister, he reigns not only on earth, but heaven and over hell. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 says, And the government will be on his shoulders. So and so, Jesus simultaneously embodies all three offices and holds the three offices in tension. One day, Jesus will raise Joshua, a prophet type, Eliezer, a priest type, and Joseph, a kingly type from the dead. For he is the resurrection who puts death to death. They will be resurrected to worship the one who is the faithful prophet, holiest priest and king of kings. One day, the new Jerusalem. Think about this. This is a future time. This is something to hold on to. One day, in the new Jerusalem, these prototypes, prophet, priests, and kings, will walk the streets of gold in the homeland of their souls. One day, in fact, believers today will worship with all saints because Jesus is the greater Joshua he calls believers, he calls you to a renewal of worship and service to God through the power of the Holy Spirit. Those who are faithful, those servants who are obedient, who are serving, who are worshiping again, will hear in that moment, well done, 
Well done for preserving, persevering through the rain. Well done for running on through the rain. Well done for learning and recounting history, the history of the ancestors of our faith. Well done for studying the word made understandable through the Spirit. For studying the word made understandable through the Spirit. Well done for teaching others the way of the cross. Well done, good, faithful, good and faithful servants. Well done. The pronouncements, the pronouncement will be made in the land of no more. They will be made in the land of no more. What do I mean by that? By that? No, more, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more suffering, no more tears. As a child of God, you will be hearing this along with all the children of God. And this should bring you goosebumps. All of God's children will hear the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he will reign forever and ever. Amen. Where are you heading? Where are you going? The, world, the idols of this world, the gods of this world, they're not going to offer anything to you. They're just going to offer you disappointment, pain, setbacks, heartache, tears. But the Lord God, the creator of this universe, God the Father, has now made you his child. And as his child, you will enter into his kingdom. Well, again, where again, there will be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more suffering, no more tears. You imagine, it's hard to imagine a world like that because we, of the world we live in today where there is just a bunch of pain and heartache and suffering. You, as a child of God, hold on to that promise. of entering into his kingdom. But now I just want to focus on those who may have heard the Lord speak to them today through this, through chapter 24 and through this message. Are you ready to grab onto the promises of God? The promises of him never abandoning you, never failing you, the God who will always keep his, keep his promises. Well, if you're ready to surrender your heart, if you're ready to surrender your life and have the Holy Spirit come and make his home in you, then I want to invite you to the cross to ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. Now, I don't want you to be mistaken. I'm not talking, when I say be filled with the Spirit, I'm not talking about, you know, all of a sudden going to be speaking in different languages and he's going to start running around and, you know, flopping like a fish and barking like a dog. No. It's, a, it's an indescribable feeling. You just know Something in you, something has entered your heart. That void that's in your heart has been filled. And that is the Holy Spirit. And it won't be long until he starts clearing out all the junk, all the idols, all the mess. He starts showing you a better way. And he gives you a fresh vision. Of this world, of this life, of others of God himself. 
And so if you're ready for that, you're ready to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And you're ready to be born again. I want you to close your eyes and bow your head. Again, with all sincerity, with all your heart, know He knows what's really in there. He wants you to give it to Him. So He wants you to give him his heart, your heart. So pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask you to forgive me. I now believe that you died for my sins and you rose from the dead three days later. I completely repent. I turn back from my sins. I throw them aside and I give them all to you and confess you and you alone as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for giving me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for saving me. So now I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. If you prayed that, you're going to be starting off the new year in the right way as a child of God. No matter how old you are, that person you once were is dead. If you need help finding your next steps or trying to find out what the next steps are in this new life, give us a call. Let us know, send us a message, and we'll help you find a church wherever you may be and um, maybe pray with you some more. I want to thank you again for watching this message one week before Christmas, the day we celebrate the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's going to be a glorious day because now... A new member has been added to the family. Have a great week. We love you. Stay warm. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.